Okay, so hi, welcome back everybody. And today I'm very excited to have on, on this show, I think I'm gonna call it Talking Reich, this one, because uh, the chap here with me today, Peter Jones from the north of England, has really been involved in Reichian work and ergonomy for I think a big chunk of his life and has over the years inspired many other uh, people to be who are interested in Reich's scientific work. You know, he's been a, an absolute stalwart for them. So without any further ado, welcome, Peter. Welcome. Thank you very much for coming on this podcast. And perhaps you could just start by speaking a little bit about yourself and your background, your history and how you got interested in Reich in the first place and this kind of thing. Thanks, Dev. Um, well, it's a fairly simple, straightforward story. Um, I was born and bred in the northwest of the UK um, and grew up in a very conventional British commuter land culture, um, which I found very stifling, uh, with many, many pressures wanted to get out of it as soon as I could, which I did when I was about 18, left home, uh, migrated to London, as lots of people do when they want to, in the UK, when they want to escape from their childhood environment. And um, I left school without university entry qualifications and a couple of years later decided I wanted to go to university, started going to night classes to get A-levels, which I managed to do and eventually got into London University. And um, a year or so into the course, a new student appeared who'd already done a bit of her course somewhere else, got into some difficulties and was moved sideways into our course, you know, so she appeared in year two. And we both recognized each other as outsiders on the edge, I think. Um, I was doing a languages degree and I, we became good friends, not boyfriend, girlfriend or anything, but, you know, just friends. Mm -hmm. And uh, she kept said, telling me, oh, you really must come home and meet my household and so on. Um, I've got these very interesting friends. Um, and eventually, you know, I mean, students are always saying that all the time, aren't they? Oh, you must come and meet, blah, blah, blah. Let's do this. Let's do that. And mm -hmm. they never do. But eventually we did. I went uh, home one evening with her and um, met the household. And I met the chap who lived upstairs, who was a minor London poet and very well-known artist model. Um, and quite well known amongst bohemian circles in London called David Cosby. Mm -hmm. And some people of my age who are very much part of the London scene in those days might recognize that name. Mm -hmm. He died a few years ago and his widow is still active in New York running a voice coaching uh, school, mm -hmm. very much inspired by Rice's work. Her name is Catherine Fitzmorris, if I've got okay. it right, I think. Mm -hmm. Have you heard of her? I haven't heard of her, no. Uh, she's quite well known in the States. She trains actors and singers and people like that. So this was back like in the, sorry, this, this was back. This would have the... been about 19, early 60s. Mm, early 60s, cool. And David was seriously into writing. He, um, in those days, Reich was virtually a non-name. Uh, there were only a couple of his books available. It wasn't easy to find out about him or read about him or read his own writings at all. And, but David had a handful of them from the days, you know, when they were originally printed in English in the States. And he uh, kept waving a copy of The Function of the Orgasm at me. Mm -hmm. Said, you really must read this chat. And at that point, in my own mental travels, I started to home in on psychology. My childhood had led me to believe that there was something terribly wrong with the world. And I wasn't sure what it was. Um, you know, in that inchoate, unexpressed way that you have when you're eight, nine, ten, even that early, I can remember having these feelings. 
And by the time I was 18, 20 or so, I was beginning to read <laughs> psychology books and home in on psychology as the best answer I thought I might find. But what I'd read at that point was all very narrow and limited, a bit of Freud, a bit of a chap called Isenck. I don't know whether you've ever come across him, a behaviorist. Yeah. yeah. Uh, who was a big name at the time, completely forgotten now, of course, but he was one of those behaviorists who, whose attitude is if you can't weigh it or measure it, it doesn't exist, um, sort of viewpoint. And I was expecting Reich to be on the same level, you know, rather boring, rather conservative and not really worth reading. So I was very resistant. And after a while, though, I got so fed up with David nagging me to read this wonderful writer about whom I knew nothing. I'd never even heard of him until David mentioned him to me. And I, more or less, with that attitude of, oh, all right, give me the bloody thing here and I'll yeah. read it. If it if yeah. It'll shut you up. You know, I'll read it. Um, and, and that's putting it politely, you know, there's probably a few uh, swear words in there. And um, I started reading it. And I just couldn't believe how Reich just came straight from the shoulder. Pow, bang, you know, he, he called a spade a spade. And um, at some point in the function, I think it's probably page 50, 60, he's talking about the the con tricks and the excuses and the rationalizations of mainstream medicine and psychiatry. He says somewhere there, how deep is this ocean of lies? And that absolutely encapsulated my feeling about my childhood background. And I thought, wow, you know, Chapu says that, you know, he's really on the ball. So I, I raced through the rest of the book and, um, I'm still studying ergonomy ever since, really. Wow. Um, uh, it was a complete revelation, and it Reich explained, you know, in his wonderfully rational, sensible, informed, knowledgeable way, so many things that, that were just vague blobs in my brain, as it were. Um, so I started plodding through the rest of his books i read um the mass psychology of fascism which mm -hmm. david also had and that impressed me greatly because i'd grown up in world war ii and i can remember the end of the war and the war had a huge symbolic significance for me you know there was this sense of this great big cloud in the sky of the war you know if you grew up then the war was everywhere you know the, the word war was in every sort of sentence that my parents ever uttered, I think. Um, and there was this great big universal baddie, Hitler. Mm. And of course, Reich explains in the mass psychology that German citizens voted Hitler into power. And of course, I'd grown up with this idea that he was a nasty brute who forced himself on the country, you know, and imprisoned everyone and... Uh, made them do what they were told um, and it was quite the opposite you know that they sort of shouted him into power uh, and you can not there's any amount of material on youtube which is very interesting psychologically where you can see the the sexual ecstasy on the faces of the crowd you know as they wave and roar and cheer hitler as he goes along in his car i don't know whether you've seen any of those videos I can, I can certainly I can certainly relate to the relate to the concept, you know, for sure, for yeah. sure. You know, I think, it, 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 you know, when you see old black and white films of Hitler dressing people back in the 30s and stuff, you know, it, it's right. that he's, yeah. he's got the crowd, you know, he's milking the crowd. He's, he's, he's embodying absolutely. some of the archetypal yeah. presence and he's absolutely pulling everyone in. And then once you've done that, of course, you can easily direct them to a mass behavior around what is wrong and how to get rid of it and this kind of thing you know and it can get pretty crazy and scary you know and point the crowd at your enemies or exactly. their their enemies exactly. or imagined enemies yes yeah and Reich, of course explains that in the mass psychology yeah. and that was a huge huge revelation to me you know and explained lots of things um 
which I'd read about and picked up in garbled ways from films and things. Mm -hmm. Because you were very much, after World War II, there were all these films, war films, you know, which presented Little Britain, you know, with its back to the wall, this wonderful heroic country, mm. um, and so on. And Reich added a huge dimension to it. Mm -hmm. um, and character analysis, I read that. That was one of the few books that was in print. You could actually buy a copy of that over the counter, mm -hmm. I think, because it was a prescribed text for trainee psychoanalysts. Yes. yes. They were told to read the first yeah. section, yeah. don't read the final sections. And um, I found that rather stodgy and boring to begin with. But then when you get into the bioenergetic and body bits of, of uh, character analysis I found that wonderfully liberating and enlightening and wise and deep still think you know that some of Reich's best writings uh, I don't know whether you know um, the uh, segmental arrangement of the armoring yeah and, um, chapter and 14 like or 13 or something yeah in the later section just, just absolutely actually, one of the, I have to admit it's one of the few sections I've actually read because I did do a do a course actually ran a course on this stuff so I thought I'd better read Wright's original work yes so that takes us on into the late six, uh, late 60s and 1969, I went to Norway to have a year's therapy with Ola Rathnes, who had been a, one of Reich's original trainees. You know, Reich was in exile in Norway yeah. from 34 to 39 mm -hmm. when he migrated to America. Mm -hmm. So he and Rathnes were good colleagues and friends, even of a sort. Um, and that, needless to say, was a huge experience. Uh, that therapy with Ragnus. And in the very first session, I had this bizarre experience of buried memories coming to the surface as the result of Ragnus digging into my muscles and drumming up my energy. Mm. Um, and Rice talks about this in the function that when the energy broke through, the memories associated with the energy came to the surface. And I'd read about that and forgotten about it. And uh, it struck me as a really strange, peculiar experience. I mean, the memories that floated to the surface weren't that significant or tra traumatizing or anything. They were very happy memories of a man who taught me and my siblings to swim. And he was a very kind, gentle, natural teacher. And uh, I knew, experienced total acceptance by him. And that was a memory that came to the surface. Mm. And uh, wow. that's the thing I mentioned to you earlier, that I would tell a neuroscientist about, you know, how do you explain that? You know, when you've not done anything to your brain, this chap's done everything with my breathing and digging into my muscles and all this stuff comes up and that raises very very important questions about the concept of memory you know and trauma and what we think of as our consciousness and self in the head you know if you get my point yeah yeah totally i mean uh yeah for sure i mean it, i mean i guess scientists are looking at these things a bit more some of my you know everything some some people I know, they, they always focus on the negative, you know, and it's good to look at the negative. But at the same time that there's a lot of corporate repression going on around current world situation and whatever, you know, there's also, you know, a lot of people looking at psychoactive substances and things like this and saying, well, how do, what, how do you account for the experiences that people have when they take these substances in terms of their brain chemistry and what's really going on? What does it point to, you know, and there's people studying depression and people studying all sorts of psychic states from a scientific level now, which has never happened in the past. It has never happened. Plus we've got better machines now and stuff like that. Mm. But, and I certainly, I followed the whole debate around, you know, is consciousness a material phenomenon, which was a big philosophical scientific debate back around 2000. 
and, and and they never really found the part of the brain that makes consciousness basically they were searching for a long time and they thought they would but they kind of it started to trail out about 2010 and most people in that field have given up now really and so different more esoteric theories of consciousness have come in like panpsychism and stuff but without drifting off into that too much it's like there is progress and movements you know and i don't know i think sometimes people expect scientists also kind of you know if you look at reich's original work they're quite strongly in the schizoid in many ways they tend to be quite dissociated in fact you could probably make a reasonable case for the development of a highly objective advanced intellect is in a sense a reaction to unsafety at the womb level or something itself you know but it's not necessarily entirely natural to have that level of super advanced objective intellect you know it's complex it's very yeah, i very, agree it's yes very, I agree. very complex it's very complex and yet of course it's incredibly useful you know we've otherwise we'd just be back in the middle ages or back in the stone age and you know, whilst people can be against things that are going on around, not many people would vote to go back to, you know, 10,000 years ago. You know, it's yeah. like, it's, it's very, very complex, you know. Well, I agree with that. I, I, um, and I have a tendency in that direction myself, you know. Um, I'm also quite a strongly emotional person, but I, I mm. think uh, it is... And even Reich had a tendency in that direction himself. You know, he obviously had a very, very good mind mm. and was very much able to pull back and see what was really going on in many mm. spheres. Mm, exactly. Yeah. And very independent. You know, I mean, yes. he, was not, he was not going to be controlled by the fact that, you know, all the other people were saying that it was like this. That wasn't mm. going to totally dominate his psyche. Mm. If he thought it was like this, then he wasn't just going to back down, basically. No, no, absolutely. So anyway, um, to keep on course, as it yes. were, um, a year or so's therapy with Ratness, with the idea of, of treating that as training to be a therapist, uh, and came back to the UK and tried to set up as a, well, I did set up as a therapist and did earn my living on and off as a therapist. But it was a struggle and um, I didn't really cope financially. I enjoyed the work and had one or two successes, therapeutic successes and one or two failures, as anyone will have. Mm -hmm. um, and got very much involved with the upbringing of my young daughter, who was conceived in Norway and was born when we came back to England um, in uh, 1970. Uh, and then there was a bit of a hiatus in my life, struggling to keep things, keep my head above water. And I almost lost contact with ergonomy at that stage, mm -hmm. um, but managed to come back to it. 1976 I'd always had this interest in Rice scientific mm -hmm. claims and discoveries mm -hmm. um, I read the cancer biopathy first in about 1964 really mm -hmm. liked the idea of the organ accumulator and the bion experiments which spoke to me on an intuitive level because I didn't have any scientific background to speak of mm -hmm. And in 1976, I built my first organ accumulator in quite an empirical way. I just wasn't going around preaching organ energy to people. I wanted to see whether an organ accumulator worked. Uh, Rackness had one. I didn't ever sit in it, didn't use it, but uh, I'd seen it. And uh, he talked about them now and again. Um, there's an act, actually a photograph of his accumulator in the Norwegian biography. Wow. But to read that biography, you've got to know Norwegian. <laughs> um, but, you know, if you ever visit, I can show you the picture. So I made this accumulator and 1976 was a very dry, drought ridden summer. Yeah, very hot. Very, very hot. Um, so good conditions for 
or any organ device compared to usual in the UK, you know, with yes. our humidity, yes. of course. Um, and I had a house full of visitors. My sister and her daughter was visiting at the time. And uh, we put the accumulator together and ever took everyone's temperature. You know, that's the, the effect that Reich said you'll get if you sit in the accumulator, your temperature goes up slightly. Mm -hmm. And everybody's temperature went up. And I was feeling, yes, yes, you know, this is it. This, <laughs> this works. Um, and was quite thrilled. And the next day, I started to make another accumulator, a little one, you know, sort of like a biscuit box size, uh, to do the seed germination experiment, which uh, he mentions in one of his books. I forget mm -hmm. which one now. Mm -hmm. And I did that experiment, and the results were absolutely phenomenal. The um, To those of you... You know, to people who are watching and don't know about it, you prepare two identical batches of seedlings, mm -hmm. um, and you count the literally you count the seeds out, say a hundred or two hundred, and you sow them on identical amounts of soil, and mm -hmm. you water them with very precisely measured amounts of water. And one batch you put in the accumulator during the day, and the other batch you leave out, and otherwise their treatment is identical. Mm -hmm. And after that, to make it easy for yourself, you use something, you choose seeds that are going to grow quickly, mm -hmm. uh, like mustard or cress or something, mm -hmm. the sort of thing that kids do, you know, in primary yeah. school. Sure. And um, the after a few days, the controls were an inch and a half wide, and the, um, I don't know where we can, yes, the difference was like this. Wow. Wow. Um, after a handful of days. Yeah. Um, and that was really quite thrilling that, that uh, it produced such a, a difference. And that experiment has been repeated probably by hundreds of people. It's all over the place. If you look at ergonomic websites, mm -hmm. uh, journals and so on, there are photographs. I had a couple on my website until it disappeared recently. And DeMeo has got photographs of it in his books yes. and on his website. Yes. Um, there was a, uh, a woman called Jutta Espanka, mm -hmm. who I think was German, but married to a Portuguese citizen who lived and worked in Portugal. And she did a lot of work with organ accumulators and gardening and seed germination in the 70s and 80s. And uh, she had regular articles in a journal called Offshoots of Organomy, mm -hmm. which I think you can still get photocopies of from De Meyer. So it's a pretty well established effect that seed germination experiment. Mm. And has um, any um, scientific explanation ever been proffered for it? Not that I know of, no. I mean, that's a good question because often when you quote a, a claim of rice, scientists just throw out a, an off the cuff excuse, you know, to dismiss it or an explanation for it, which is not an ergonomic explanation. Mm. But that one, no, uh, um, I don't know what they'd say. Um, but I worked very hard to make sure that the conditions for the controls and so on were really identical. Yeah. And, that, and that's what DeMeo's done with his TO minus T experiment. You know, mm -hmm. you can do these experiments in a fairly rough way which is fine, I think, to begin with. But if you're really going to put them forward and make major yeah. claims, then you need to refine your method methodology and make sure that it's uh, it's absolutely watertight, which yeah. I have done. Well, I one imagine, possible, sorry? Well, I was just going to say, I should imagine with the mustard seeds or similar, you know, that that's quite a good example because you could just create a pretty good double blind randomized trial. You know, you've got one load here, Got one yeah. that's absolutely identical. Everything is identical, or well, there's enough of them to, to, to compensate for any differences in, in individual yes. seeds. And then one are being subjected to the organ accumulator for a number of hours a day, and the other ones aren't. You know, it sounds like the basis were pretty pretty good experiment, and it's been reproduced a lot of times. Yes, exactly. Hard exactly. to see how it could be fiddled, really. That's right. The only explanation excuse as it were which you 
could throw at it, which I think I've dealt with is that, ah, oh, well, the seeds in the accumulator are in, in the dark and the other seeds aren't. And I immediately thought of that straight away um, because if you put plants in the dark and there's a tiny bit of light somewhere, they shoot up towards the light. I mean, that's how people force celery yes. and things. Yes. You can make plants grow artificially faster. Yes. So when I had the orgone treated seeds in the accumulator, I covered the others with a cardboard box, you know, to keep the uh, light from them. Mm. I right. guess I yeah. need... Sorry? I guess ideally you'd want to have like one organ accumulator and one which is identical but which isn't hasn't got the layers of organic or inorganic material yes. or something to just yes make, you could do that yes yeah just pure wood or something I don't yes. know yeah I mean an accumulator that looks the same but has yeah. no accumulating yes facility mm -hmm. is possible I mean that's been that's what De Mayo's done I think with his TO minus T mm -hmm. experiment. Um, so, yes, and the next thing which I had at the back of my head was the Bion experiments, mm -hmm. for which I needed a microscope, you know, and I was still pretty hard up at this time and didn't have money to buy a decent microscope. Yes. So that came much later. And in the, in the meantime, I'd been developing this interest in the use of orgone therapy in childbirth. Yes. As you know, through Dan. And in 91, I started training as a midwife, which was um, a huge leap of sort of blind courage and faith, really. Mm. I was already 50 and a man, and applying for a place on a midwifery course seemed to be, you know, on a hiding to nothing, I thought. Yeah. Um, and they just brought in this new sort of training where you could train as a midwife without having been a nurse before. Uh, it was called at the time direct entry training. And now most midwifery training is follows that pattern. Mm -hmm. And then to my amazement and utter delight, I got a place on the course, three year course, university diploma level. And I trained and qualified and got a job, permanent job in the NHS. And for the first time in my life, I was earning, by my standards, a reasonable salary. Mm -hmm. And uh, without trying, you know, I was accumulating money in the bank. And uh, as soon as I saw these figures, I thought, yes, buy an experiment. Let's do it. <laughs> you get a microscope. So I bought a microscope, um, ridiculously expensive, high quality, top end microscope partly out of ignorance you know i didn't know about the cheap chinese imports mm -hmm. um, i went straight to olympus who make possibly the most expensive and best quality microscopes in the world certainly if not the best you know amongst mm -hmm. the best um which was quite a ridiculous thing to do it's like someone who's got had a few driving lessons you know buying a jaguar or a rolls yeah. royce yeah. Just, totally um didn't mix at all um, you, you, it turned you, out to be the best done. thing i've ever done <laughs> yeah d d was it also that you for for um wright's original experiments bion experiments you need quite a high power microscope don't you i mean i'm not yes sure, but three thousand yes. plus or something i'm not sure what kind of well method. you don't need that to start with but you Ideally, you want a microscope that you can get that magnification in the end, yes, mm -hmm. because your 3000X allows you to see the blueness of the orgone field and the internal orgone charge of a bion mm -hmm. and the, the pulsation of it. Um, but at the time, my microscope didn't go that far. I, um, but it had the potential and I knew it had the potential. Mm -hmm. the, uh, a high quality mm -hmm. microscope like that is very, if you like, ergonomy friendly. It's all modular. It's not like buying a car where you buy the whole thing, you know, mm -hmm. maybe one or two trimmings. You, 
is the equivalent of literally choosing what wheels you want to put on, what tires mm -hmm. you want to put on, what, what sort of seats you want, you know, and whether you want a six cylinder or a 10 cylinder engine and so on. You, you can add all the bits yes. according to your own preference. Yes. Um, and it, you didn't need a, a huge, to know a lot about microscopy to be able to do that. Mm -hmm. So I bought a basic version with one or two refinements. And then later I added what they call a magnification changer, mm -hmm. which gives you the capacity for this very high magnification. Mm -hmm. um, but that was um, a few years later. And all these extra components of Olympus quality are incredibly expensive. You know, the magnification changer itself costs 2000 quid. Well, for 2,000 quid, you could buy two quite nice student-grade Chinese microscopes. You know? But the quality of the Olympus components is, is out of this world. It's in, mm -hmm. It is incredibly high quality. And the cruel thing about it is the better your microscope, the easier the work is. Mm -hmm. Do you play a musical instrument at all? Well, I used to play the guitar a bit. Well, you'll know that, you know, a little guitar that costs you 40 quid is agony to play and crap and really difficult. Yeah. And a <laughs> guitar costing 2,000 quid is beautiful to play and really yeah. easy yeah. because the action is so sensitive and gentle yeah. and so on. And it's very much like that with microscopes. And, and the, the Olympus was a dream to work with. Mm -hmm. When I got it, I was, to be honest, terrified of it. Um, and was crossing bridges left, right, and centre, imagining various problems, and uh, they they just fell away as I started to do the experiments. You know, it, uh, they really um, worked very well and did exactly what Rice claimed they would do. Mm. So you basically kind of replicated the effect. What what were you actually looking at under the microscope? Well, my first experiment was bions from garden soil mm -hmm. i had my microscope i was in living in this rented house in hull at the time where i'd ended up the job market had washed me ashore in hull mm -hmm. i had a bit of a garden and um i'd read about bion experiments using garden soil mm -hmm. so i just went out into the garden and got a couple of teaspoonfuls of soil mm -hmm. and um heated them to red heat in mm -hmm. the flame on my gas cooker. You know, mm -hmm. it was that simple and primitive. Um, and that sterilize, obviously, if you heat something to red heat, you sterilize it completely. Yes. yes. And I added it to some boiled water in a test tube and uh, drew up a few drops with a what lab people call a dropping syringe, mm -hmm. which is a sort of thing that, that you, you use to put drops in your eye or ear. Mm -hmm. simple glass tube with a so, yes. narrow little point and a rubber Teat. balloon at the yeah. top end very simple piece of equipment you can buy them by the dozen you know from any yeah. educational supplier yeah and there were my biomes you know i'd been shown a bion experiment once before in germany and uh, so i knew what to expect what they were going to look like and how mm -hmm. they were going to behave. Mm -hmm. um, and I just didn't look back really. Once I got the basic experiment worked out, I just started testing everything inside, you know, for, to see whether it produced, they produced biomes. Mm -hmm. And the, there's a more complicated experiment, which I did after a few investigations, which is what I call the grass infusion experiment. Mm -hmm. Um, I think I can probably show you a picture here. Um, in the grass infusion experiment, Rice devised this very simple Blue Peter style setup mm -hmm. with what's called a cavity slide. And that's a microscope slide with a little saucer shaped dip in the middle. And you put a couple of blades of grass 
on the center of the slide and glue them down to the mm -hmm. glass with some a mixture of Vaseline and paraffin wax. Mm -hmm. and cover that with a cover slip, which is a tiny little window of very thin glass, mm -hmm. about um, two centimeters square. Mm -hmm. um, and you then got your grass in this saucer shaped hollow covered with glass. Mm -hmm. and you add water to the hollow and the grass starts after a couple of days the grass has started to break down and produce biomes mm -hmm. all over the place you know you start to see one or two in the water and then you see three and four and then ten and before you know where you are there are hundreds and you get these blisters at the edge of the grass rice called them vesicles which break away from the grass as a separate organism. Mm -hmm. And they are, before they break away, the, this bubble is seething with biomes. You know, the biomes are very vigorous and spin at a, a great rate. And that is a, a I'm still looking for this um, picture to show you um, or to show people who are watching. Um, don't think I'm going to be able to find it quickly enough. Well, you could, um, you know, you know, it won't, it won't show so good on the film. But what you could do is send it to me afterwards. Yes. And then I can kind of put it in or cut it in, maybe. It's the top. Okay. That top picture there yeah. is the grass infusion experiment. Can you uh -huh. get the picture? I can see it. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And um, that's in my, my book. Might as well plug it while I'm at it. Yeah. <laughs> um, but I, I wrote and published the book much later. Mm. Um, so that was the start of, you know, a long period where I was looking down my microscope every spare minute almost. Mm -hmm. um, How did it feel to be um, to be replicating these? experiments of Reich for you emotionally? Incredibly exciting and rewarding and satisfying to know that he was right. Um, a huge turmoil of emotions really because it was so terrible to think that he was right, you know, and in spite of that, how he was treated, you know, ending up dying in prison. And that, that was just awful to feel that that had happened to him. Mm -hmm. But it was wonderful to be able to justify him. And I felt quite proud to myself, you know, that I'd managed to do this independently. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's one of my strengths. I've always been a great self-teacher. And I manage much better learning things myself, usually, than mm -hmm. I do with a teacher. Um, and I had a very rough time at school um, in that way. Yeah. When I, I, I referred to my A-levels, you know, I did most of those I did on my own. I did go to classes, but uh, three hours a week, you know, once a week was quite a, a limited teaching input. Mm -hmm. And most of the work just by definition had to come from you as a student. Um, and I started showing other people the experiments you know what once you know all about that you, you you really want to tell the world and I did tell the world or tried to but they because they, they weren't very interested yeah but I, I still go on telling sympathetic people about the bion experiments and demonstrate them to people I've got quite a handful of microscopes so I can run workshops you know and I have run one or two workshops mm -hmm. Um, but there's not much interest actually in the Bion experiments. The last event I tried to run about five years ago was a Bion workshop, a Bion seminar, you know, and I got mm. one would be student from Spain. Yeah, so, I mean, um, I guess the world moves in a kind of, you know, it, it, it goes a bit like like a flock of uh animal birds or or animals sometimes they're kind of the whole herd is moving in one direction and anyone that tries to say well well guys i think we should be going over here you know they're either going to get sledgehammered out 
or they're just going to get completely ignored and forgotten. And this is just like part of our DNA, actually, you know, it's, it's in the mind as well, I think, you know, in the, it could, I mean, so it could well be the case, you know, that Reich was entirely right, you know, that he had discovered some scientific or fairly scientific means to affirm the existence of some form of like natural life energy, you know, which is kind yeah. of analogous to Hindu or, you know, Far Eastern, even yeah. Jewish kind of concepts, you know, of prana, chi, yeah. chaya, whatever, you know, and he kind of affirmed that. But he was immersed in a society at the time, on uh, an intellectual society that was completely uninterested in this, really, and just wasn't, and was very excited about certain other things going on, and and that was, and that was somewhat how it was, somewhat how it was. And I think things like this happen very easily. But as humans, we tend to kid ourselves that we're super developed, but actually, we're kind of like fairly simple hominids with a lot of technology at the moment you know it's like it's not you know i saw you know in the recent kind of lockdown measures and stuff a lot of people i don't think there would have been much different if it had happened in the 1300s you know people's behavior is essentially the same their their mindset essentially the same and I, and i don't think scientists are significantly different from that you know they also have group behavior dynamics that they get involved in you know such as reich was unraveling with mass psychology of fascism you know it's the same kind of forces that are there inside the human brain shaped from our ancestry, you know, because they had a survival advantage, you know, millions of years ago, and that got conferred and written into our DNA, you know. So, yeah, Reich ended up in a very unfortunate way, and I don't even know the circumstances of his actual death. I think he was, it was, it was put down as cardiac arrest or something like this. Yeah. 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 And, you know, it was very, it's very, very sad. I mean, as Dan Lowe said, you know, one of the saddest things was that ideally if Reich had had that kind of late stage, age 60 to 80, kind of, you know, summing up his work, integrating it and bringing it all together a little bit more, maybe things would have worked out a bit different, maybe not. I don't know. I mean, there's, there's huge thrusts of activity that go on in Western culture. It's why I say it's kind of complex earlier on is because what I see is that most of the things that we have in the West especially in the West, have come through the traumatized brain. You know, without the systematic traumatization of children, you probably would not have developed Western culture to the level which it has. It's very complex. And I was always around, you know, being in the Osho scene and being in the conspiracy scene years ago, a lot of people who wanted to believe that there was simply an evil force that was trying to control humanity. And for a while I believed that, but at some point I started to think, well, you know, it's, it's actually much, much more complex than that. That's a very appealing model and it stirs up a certain level of basic residual emotional energy within me. Uh, and that's a force which people who are heavily into conspiracy tend to tend to function on, in my opinion and experience. But nevertheless, mm. it's not necessarily the case. It's not necessarily true when you really step back a little bit and look, you know, without all the kind of schizoids who are in their head inventing things and doing crazy stuff in here and the scientists and the mathematicians and the designers and without all the kind of endurer or what was originally called masochistic personality who will simply get along with a drudge job just chugging along and complaining but never really doing anything about it but will get up and do it, you know, without without the rigids who will kind of organize society and aspire towards higher values and get totally immersed in hierarchical structures and social posturing, it's hard to imagine that Western culture would really have, have, have arrived with us, you know? So you've got all these people with these psychological dynamics as Reich very, very accurately espoused, even though he didn't go so deeply maybe into, into where that ends up in, in society, you know? And of course, all tribes and all cultures have used traumatization as a mechanism to, to further their own ends and to, to, to act like macro entities that want to continue like an individual organism, you know, it's their own evolution. And then th this, this is also how it is. This, this is also how it is, you know, and we're kind of at a stage in our society where a lot of people want to de-traumatize on a personal level or on a, on a societal level and since the 50s and 60s that has been going on, but at the same time, there hasn't really been necessarily to my mind an understanding of, okay, yes, you can de-traumatize people and make them into nice people, but actually can they really survive in what is still a very kind of simple dominance hierarchies of the world? You know, it's not, 
you know, it's, it's it, 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 I don't know. What I'm trying to say is it's very, very complicated and I can understand why what happened to Reich happened to him without necessarily needing to recourse to a, a, a mental model of some kind of negative agency trying to control everything. It's, it's actually more complex than that. Anyway, I didn't mean to quite embark oh. on that. No. That that model of, of this great big negative agency yeah. is surely the the off the great big social offshoot of armoring, you know, the the intellectus defense function. And it in a sense, those paranoid people who say there's this great big thing, you know, doing all this to us. Yes, it, it's it's a culture where so many people think like that, function like that. Mm. And you can, well, I I hear it when they wheel out a scientist on the radio or TV, uh, say a neuroscientist, and you hear them spouting with their conventional current day model. Um, and that's what I hear speaking, you know, mm. a, a, a part of them, which almost every scientist has, you know, and which almost every ordinary citizen just jogs along with, you know, mm. maybe don't really understand it, but they... Oh, aren't they clever chaps you know that's mm. so that's how we work sort of thing um yes yes so in a sense it is a great big force just made up of millions and millions of people yes it, it is a great big force but it's also it also researches stuff and doesn't find it and then it has to come back and start changing models you know and that has happened you know that has happened yes. in science it has happened and i mean i wouldn't be surprised to, to to see something like organomy take off massively in 50 to 100 years i wouldn't be surprised you know if it, it's if our society can kind of overcome some of the, uh, the kind of almost algorithmic controls that just it, it's like we're in this very late stage it feels like to me where you know everything's only being done if it's being done for money you know that's that that's it and and, mm -hmm. and if there's profit in it, then we'll research it. And, you know, and if there isn't, then you probably aren't going to get a grant to research this. And that's how it is. But it's quite possible that that model could start to shift and change in the next 20, 30, 40 years. It's under a lot of pressure from a lot of sides. And there is potential for change. And if that happens, and we start to have like scientists who can more say, instead of saying, okay, uh, you know, if, if, I, if I apply to get a research grant to research this, uh, I might get it from a corporation because you could make money, or I might get it from the National Institute of Health, in, which is the American kind of big body of, you know, mm. controlling these things. So I might, they're, they're the two main areas where I could get a grant so I can get paid to do this research. Instead of being in that kind of straitjacket as a scientist, it's more like, actually, I'd really like to replicate some of Reich's bion experiments. And some venture capitalist billionaire says, that's cool. How much is it going to cost? 500,000. There you go. Off you go. You know, and you start to get a, a, a much the stranglehold that certain agencies have got over science and scientific development. It, it starts to be broken. You know. Well, that's what would appear to have happened with Rupert Sheldrake. Are you familiar with his work? Yeah, a little bit. Morphic resonance was it? Yes. And, um, he and seems pets that know when they're dogs. Big... Dogs that know when their owners are. Yes. No. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. And the sense of being stared at and so on. Yes. I mean, that's very much outside the paradigm. And he seems to be financed by somebody because he carries on working and he's not part of any institution or anything. Yeah. And if you watch his videos, you know, he does things at home and goes for a walk outside uh, within reach of his home and so on. He, he's obviously supported by somebody. And as you were saying, 500,000 to the right sort of person is peanuts. Um, yeah, and, uh, you know, I, I mean, I just think, uh, like we were saying earlier, you know, about your website being down and stuff like that. It's important to keep this stuff up and just to yes. it's there as some kind of record, you know. You've got the experiments. And then what I also see is you've got the personalities of the people who, who have done the experiments and who have advanced the theories. And sometimes the two get a little bit in the way in reality, you know, and that's just how it is. You know, someone with Reich's personality, and, you know, I've, I've, I'm not a total expert on Reich. I read Sharaf's book, which I thought was very good, but it would be good to read mm -hmm. some more biographies and to read Reich himself. But I can also imagine that someone who isn't going to back down, 
you know, someone who isn't really going to just take the path of least resistance, which is what most humans will do, also can be a tricky person to deal with socially, can also be a tricky person to advance theories and stuff like that. It's also, it's, it's part of it, in a sense. And the pioneer is very likely to be someone like that. Yes. You have to be like that, you know, yes. to break through all the resistance. Yes. And a more amenable, charming, friendly, media friendly type person, you know, in 50 years time would have an easier time of it. Yeah. But you need the pioneer and you need some poor soul who's who's who, in a sense, is almost going to die for the cause because yeah. part of their personality is in the same way. I, I mean, I don't know. I, I read that Reich. You know, the case against Reich was not really that huge, as I understand it, but it was more that he kind of refused even legal support from people who were into organomy and he elected to, to make yes. it in his own defence. Yes. Because even the most basic person with legal understanding will tell you that, what is it the judges used to say? The client who has himself as a, uh, as a, as a lawyer as a fool for a client or something like that, you know, it's yeah. like, just don't represent yourself, just don't yeah. do that. But to certain psychological stereotypes, they, they will do that. You know, they will do that because it's like that, that's part of their internal concept, either because they like to take the risk to just be totally on the line or they have this kind of messianic complex, almost where they're almost inviting to be cast down, you know, and to, to martyr themselves or because they just have this basic belief for, in good and, it, and that if they can just be there in front of people, it will all be okay. And these beliefs are not good beliefs, you know, especially... Well, right, friends. A.S. <laughs> uh, Neil, you know, A.S. Do you know who A.S. Yes. Neil? He advised him. There's, there's letters, you know, he yeah. advised him to get a, a lawyer and so on. Yes. And I think Rackness did the same. Yes. Um, and I think uh, right acted very unwisely if you're going to be objective about it in, in terms of winning or losing the case yeah i think right but his argument you know that the court has no right to decide on scientific tr truth is totally waterproof that argument i mean he's dead right yeah but it wasn't really the, was it really the, the I mean, the, the case, wasn't it about the accumulators? Was it about the accumulators? Uh, and that it was it kind of like quackery or something like this, but I can't, I don't remember the actual, what do they call the it? The technical offence, you see, was, it sounds strange to English ears, but apparently in the States, you're not allowed to trade medical devices over state borders. Mm. And the case had got to the point where they enjoined Rice not to do this. Yeah. And one of Rice's trainee students, a Dr. Silvert, had actually moved one from, say, Maine to New York or vice yes. versa. I forget the details. And so technically that's a, an offence yeah. uh, for which Rice and the other doctor were, were liable, you know, and that's how they were clobbered. And it, Reich didn't attend the court, you see, his written yes. response yes. wasn't considered a reasonable legal response. So he was got for contempt of court. Yeah. And that's always, I think, in American and British legal culture, that the court, it could be quite a minor business to start with, but they come down like a ton of bricks on anyone who commits contempt of court. You know, if you look at the sentences, the punishments thrashed out for that, it's always pretty severe because the court you know, sort of stands on its own dignity. Yeah, I mean, and, 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 and there's a value to that as well, you know. I mean, that's the thing. I mean, it was tragic what happened to Reich. It was absolutely tragic what happened to Reich. But also, he was not tragic victim martyr, in my opinion, basically. You know, he also did sow the seeds of his own demise quite strongly yeah. and, and that's just how it is and and it is tragic what happened to him you know but then mm. that's yeah that's that's it is how it is it is what it is at the end of the day i guess mm. and all we can do is to is, is to uh you know look at these parts of his work and and continue to 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 simply make it available uh, you know yes exactly exactly yeah I think we both very much agree on that, don't we? You know, yeah. 
it's yeah the whole point is to keep it alive as as alive as we can at the moment so that it's there for the future yeah i think that's a good course because uh you know it's not going to be easy to to c convince the average citizen that there's something of value here you know it's not going to be easy you know it's not easy to quantify effects it's not e you know the public is brought up on the notion of a kind of cure magic bullet kind of thing and i, I don't believe that you know i've never worked with an organ accumulator but i don't believe it's a magic bullet i believe it's more something that you would see a positive effect over time if you stick with it and you find the right ways to measure things even if they're subjective you know it's it's going to be a long haul would be my understanding you know i would not I don't know, I, I wouldn't personally agree from what the evidence I've seen, but it's a cure for cancer. And I don't think Mike ever said it was, even though he was kind of a, accused of it uh, at yeah. times. You know, this whole concept of cures gets a lot in the way, I think. But, but going back to something you said, the, the, the silver bullet, um, yeah. the magic bullet, I think that is part of the problem. People are so conditioned by the magic bullet model you know, and when they talk about research into a cure for whatever it ha happens to be, cancer, Alzheimer's and so on, COVID, it's always a magic bullet. Yeah. And they can't imagine that the energy of a weird gadget like an organ accumulator and a patient can do much together, or even more so, you know, your energy and a patient that you're working with. You know, people can't see that as doing anything. Mm. It's just too fine, too delicate, too simple. And I noticed in my midwifery work, even when it was quite blatant that I'd done something, I'm thinking of a particular case with a baby, the mother in question saw what I'd done, that it had worked almost magically, but she didn't ask me what I'd done and how and why and where it came from at all. And I told, it's, so this is a breastfeeding anecdote and it's quite interesting, I think, if you can bear to hear it. Sure. Um, I'd looked after this lady who, um, on a ward for two or three consecutive days and her baby had great difficulty feeding on the breast. She was a well-educated middle-class lady, classic, sort of patient who would want to breastfeed the baby because they read about all the differences between breastfeeding and bottle feeding and she had a really tough time you know no two ways about it this baby was a very poor feeder to begin with and we got her feeding and I thought this is it you know we've done it we managed it. and the next day she'd slip back to where she was and she wouldn't take the breast and she was just beset the baby beset with frustration and rage and if you've ever seen a two or three day old baby who wants to feed and can't get on the breast you know the energy behind it is just uh, unbelievable and deadly you know mm. and the baby screams at the nipple as if the nipple's its worst enemy wow and i immediately thought of a little bit of organ therapy for this baby to pull her energy out of her head to even her energy up so that she calmed down because you cannot get a baby who is enraged like that you know to get on the breast to, to mm. take the breast a baby has to be calm and hungry mm -hmm. and i said to her well there's one thing i that might work at worst it won't work it's harmless Mm -hmm. But I must advise you, it's not what we were taught in the midwifery classroom and you won't find it in the midwifery textbooks. Mm -hmm. And she just waved her hands at me in desperation. She was in floods of tears at this point mm -hmm. and said, Peter, just do it, do it, please, anything to get her to feed. So I did what I sort of worked out mentally, I pulled her energy down into the rest of her body. She immediately switched off. All this rage just, you know, went like that. And I carried on stroking her back just to sort of make sure, you know, that the effect was going to last mm -hmm. 
for long enough to get me from get the baby from me my hands to the to the mother mm -hmm. and I nodded to her and said get yourself ready I think she'll feed now please and she did and it took two or three minutes but the strange thing was this perfectly educated intelligent woman obviously used to reading about things mm -hmm. and so on I think she was a teacher of some sort or other mm -hmm. she didn't say wow what have you done that worked can I read about that? Is there a book about it? You know, has anyone written about it? You know, she she just ignored it. Quite peculiar. And that was the, the reaction I got when I started to help mums in labour, you know, with their breathing. Mm -hmm. They'd often say how effective it was and how helpful it was being. But no one, not one, asked me where it came from, what I was doing, where did I learn that? Could she learn that? You know, could she teach it to other expectant mums and things? Nobody ever asked me. Mm. I guess not so many people have an inquiring mind, really. Some do, eh? But there are very few, yes, you're right, yeah. I noticed myself, like, I worked in construction for a, for a few years, quite a while, and then I learned to become an electrician. And I had this kind of mind where I was kind of interested. It would send me on maintenance jobs when something had gone wrong, because I would like to go into a house and try and work out what had gone wrong. So, you know, I kind of enjoyed it, you know, yes. like a challenge. And it was like, OK, let's trace all this circuitry out and see what's actually kind of not working or where there's a blockage or the wire's broken or whatever's happening, you know. And I used to enjoy that kind of thing. And then when I became a therapist, in a sense, it's a little bit similar. You know, you're kind of working out where things are blocked in, in a certain sense, you know. But most people do not have that kind of mind. You know? And I learned, no. I learned to kind of, what we tend to do when, when we're assessing someone speaking is we kind of feel them and make some judgment about who they are. And then we decide how, how seriously we're going to take what they say. So if you kind of don't have any qualifications, say, for example, and say I was ugly, unqualified, and I'm raving away about something, you know, the overwhelming majority of people are never going to listen to what I say because I'm presenting as someone who probably doesn't know what he's talking about. And if I am very sort of rigid and have a PhD and a lab coach and I start to say this, then most people would say, oh, yes, well, they obviously know what they're doing because we're visually and kind of kinesthetically taking the person in and making an assessment quite early on as to whether we should believe what they say because there's so much information around we need to do that and because that presumably was how hunter gatherers and our earlier ancestors functioned you know when we first started to develop a, a higher mind you know but it's left us in this kind of position where I, I, I often when i was working a lot as a therapist and listening to people a lot i would start to really listen to what they say as opposed to because it's very easy as a therapist also to to tune in someone to see clearly where they're we're lacking and needing something and to tune out a bit what they're actually saying which doesn't really work because they want to be listened to on some level so even if what they are saying is a heap of old nonsense it's still useful to listen to it and to engage with them on that level as well you know and i found that a lot easier to do than, 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 than some of the therapists I, I, I knew because I was kind of interested in what's what's really going on underneath this. And yes, I know what you're saying. Yes, yeah. and, and I have a similar cast of mind. Um, I like to know how things work, even things which are fairly <laughs> irrelevant to me. I just like to know how they work. Um, uh, or to experiment, you know, this, this kind yes. of thing. It's you know, let's have this therapy as a kind of experiment. Let's just look what happens if we do this. Let's try this, you know, and take some of the kind of pure thing out of it a little bit, you know. Let's get a bit experimental instead of that, having what them. happens if we do this, if we do that, you know, that's what a two or a three year old does. Mm hmm playing with bricks you know what mm. happened if we put another brick on the top crash <laughs> oh it falls down <laughs> <laughs> but it's such a, it's such a great space to be able to work from as well you know yes you yes know? i mean i suppose without thinking you know that's informed a lot of my ergonomic work you asked me about the bion experiments and maybe it sounded all a bit linear and just following right experiment one two three four but a lot of the time i was um doing that sort of what happens if 
approach. Yeah, yeah. Mm. Because then, it, I don't know, it doesn't, it takes away some of the expectation, you know, and the expectation gets to be a drama a lot of the time, you know, because we build up expectations. If someone, I've got clients coming all the time who like, you know, they've done 17 different therapies or whatever, and are you going to be the one that can heal me, you know? And mm-hmm. they put all this pressure on me and themselves as well, you know, in this kind of mindset of kind of what exercise am I going to do that's going to completely heal me, you know? It's like you have to, from my perspective, I have to take them out of that mindset more, you know, where they you know, and, and on a macro level, you know, out in the world, we see that in Western culture. It's a huge kind of thing where there's this huge expectation of, of what someone's going to be able to do or a corporate entity is going to do and then we kind of know it's all a bit corrupt and mad but we've still got this massive expectation you know it's like i don't know it's like somewhere we we we, we, we don't take as much responsibility for our own healing and life as, as we could mm-hmm. do you know we want to we want to put responsibility on some outside agency and even though they never really deliver what we need you know, it still feels good to have someone else to blame for it, you know, rather than rather than ourselves taking responsibility and moving forwards. And it's just just characteristic to the human condition, I think, that the majority of people are never going to want to, or maybe never is way too strong, but, you know, it, it takes quite some energy for someone, for me, it took quite some energy to get me to actually become interested in my inner world because I was so in kind of denial and, and, and survival, I'd hardened it over and wasn't even aware that I'd hardened it over. And, 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 and I think that's a reality for a huge number of people. You know, it's like- Yes. And that's how armoring works. You, you, you're not aware that you've done it. Yeah. Yeah. But, and another point which you just brought to the surface was something you said, I forget what it was now, and I noticed this in the NHS coming into that medical world. And it's particularly relevant, say, to childbirth, where women aren't ill, they're just doing something, you know, that a woman does. Yeah. How completely uninterested the medical approach is in the individual sensations and reports. And, and experience and I, I'm a, a patient now you know I've got a heart condition and I start you know with my background of course I'm interested in what's going on inside me and I start to talk about things from that point of view and mm. I notice how the doctors will just switch off there's this huge resource you know you as a patient, you know, you, you, you know what's going on inside yourself. You can talk about it, report it. And the doctor just doesn't want to know because they're focused on things that they can measure and test and so on. Exactly. I mean, they're kind of like so many people in, in this kind of very objective kind of world. They're driven by dopamine, really. They want to get a result. So they don't, yeah. they're not really interested in the experiment or the internal state. It's more, okay, if I give them this pill, will they get better? You know, or will, you know, this, this, and it's not that that's not without value, but it's kind of, yeah, I mean, we all know how it is, you know, we all know how it is because we're in the world. And when you look at the level of, I've just been in the Ukraine, you know, no one will take the vaccine, no one trusts it at all, you know, and it's like, you know, no one protests, but we just find a way around it. You know, they just ignore it collectively. And that's just how it is, you know, and it's like we, we've all somewhere, there's been so many people in the West or, or wherever who are just, you know, they, they, they're not going to go and take to the streets and protest and rage about things. But then they're also, they're also very, very apathetic about, you know, modern culture and commerce and big, big corporations, you know, they're totally apathetic, you know, they're not inspired by anything those corporations are doing, you know, they just see them as a kind of an evil of the world or how how the world is, maybe a necessary evil to a degree, you know, I just see so many people like that, you know, who are just, you know, we're just in this kind of standoff, you know, the corporations are just, no, it's like this, no, it's like this, no, it's like this. And the people are like, yeah, but, and then they're kind of whatever, you know, it's just. I would imagine in the Ukraine, 70 years of communism contributes hugely to that sort of attitude. 
I mean, for sure, you know, I, 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 I mean, Ukrainians were kind of singled out a little bit as being not really fitting in with the kind of great communist vision. Mm. So Stalin basically starved uh, Holodomir. He basically yes. starved them out yes. in 33, 31, 32, 33. Yes. Uh, I don't know, three to five million deaths from starvation, mm. literally, because they didn't really fit in with his vision of collectivized farming, you know, coming from a more yes. traditional peasant background. Yes, I know that history. Yeah. Yeah. I've read about it. Yeah. And then Chernobyl, of course, didn't really help things either, you know, no. right, right at the end of a communist regime. So, yeah, they, so, you know, even people who are old who obviously should take the vaccine, if you actually ask me personally, it would be a very good strategy for them. They're, they're, they're just completely uninterested, you know. So. Mm. But that there is this, we haven't really picked that up in the West properly. We haven't picked it up on a psychological level to say, why do so many people, are they so distrustful? Why are they so distrustful? And what actually is a positive way forward? We haven't got to that. We're still at the kind of one camp saying, do this, and the other camp saying, either saying no or just not doing it anyway, you know? Yes. Maybe that will move on at some point and there'll be some more, I don't know, change. But you keep talking about some um, evolutionary patterns and things, yeah. and uh, that lack of overt rebellion, but just not doing it, just pushing it behind you, <laughs> seems to me it's it's a, a an improvised solution, you know, that people come up with on the quiet. Yeah, well, it's a right here. I mean, right in terms, it's masochist, you know, the endurer strategy, you know, you just go into survival mode. Yeah. You don't comply, but you don't fight. Yeah. I mean, it seems that that's what even in extreme dictatorship, say like Nazi Germany and Stalinist Russia, that's what people did. And we're doing it here too a bit, you know, it's not so extreme here because we... Um, we haven't got that far yet, touch wood. <laughs> I think also it's like just being in and, and seeing the people and, you know, just seeing them on the subway every day or whatever, it's like, and all that they've been through, really, or they're, they're, they're and the generations before them have been through, you can see there's a kind of, there's a resilience, there's a knowledge that you can endure, that you can go through these extreme experiences that very few people in the West really have been through in the last hundred years. that You can go through this extremity of experience and you can endure. You know, there is something kind of salvific or redemptive in that. You know, yes. it's like, that we are not just all these ideas and how things should be and whatever. There is something that can endure as well. I was not really in touch with that until I went to the Ukraine and started to just be there and just feel the people a bit. Yes, I mean, I haven't been to the uh, ex-communist countries, but I can imagine that. That, that is very believable. And the, the it would be very interesting if a handful of people who know about ergonomy and rice work had a go at interpreting that. You know, that's my um, immediate reaction to that. The idea of a whole culture having that sort of feeling, you know, it must, that's worth investigating. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think Reich, I mean, I think Reich was born in the Ukraine, if I remember correctly. He, he was, was born, born in the extreme eastern end of the Austro Hungarian Empire. So I think where he was born is now in the Ukraine, yeah, in yeah. The Ukraine, yeah. Yeah, outside, he was in Galicia, outside Lviv. That's it, right, it, yes. Yeah. Yes. And I kind of meant to go there, but never got it together. And there was a lot of travel restrictions from COVID as well, but it wasn't a good excuse, but it would have been nice to go to the village where he actually was born. But I didn't, uh, I didn't just yes. a little place about uh, about an hour outside Lviv, I think near the Polish border or that in that direction. But yeah, I didn't see so much. I didn't really look around, but I didn't see so much evidence of Reich there. But I think in Mexico City, there's, there's, uh, by global standards, quite a bustling Reich scene as well, from what I can gather. I would imagine so, yes. There'll be much more to see there, yeah. I don't suppose there's anyone working in the field in the Ukraine at all, whereas it's obvious from what I've picked up on websites and things. 
that there's quite a few uh, academics, psychologists and psychiatrists and people in Mexico City who are seriously studying Reich and his work. Yeah, I look forward to a report. How long do you, are you expecting to go for? I mean, just three months initially, you know, really in Mexico City. But uh, that, 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 yeah, I want to ch check it out. It is interesting how it's for Latin people that pick up this stuff, eh? you know, it's also in Europe. You know, it's like if, if you want to find bioenergetics, you go to Italy, basically. You're going to go to Italy, maybe Portugal a bit or Spain, but, you know, in Northern Europe, a bit in Germany, a bit in Germany, to be yeah. fair, but the bodywork kind of side of therapy, you're going to, you're, it's, it's pretty accepted, you know, in, in somewhere like Italy, if you're, if you're a therapist, you'd know about bioenergetica, you know, it's like you go to, you go to London and try and find someone who knows about it, you, you're going to be, you're going to be, you know, you're not going to get very far. Basically, it's interesting, but but this is a strong Latin connection, you know. Oh well, don't I know it? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> there is a strong, fairly focused, small ergonomic community in Greece as well. Okay. Um, I went to a very lively conference there a few years ago, and there were. I think 30 Greek people attending and 10 people from the rest of Europe. Well, you imagine getting 30 Brits together. Yeah. You just, it's unthinkable. And the population of Greece is tiny, you know, it's 10 million or something. So there's a, a lot stronger interest there than there is in, in the UK. Yeah, something like when for the Latin groups, you know, when their intellect develops, they still keep contact somewhere. They don't completely detach with their intellect or something. They they're still interested in the heart connection. They're still interested in the, you know, in the, in, in in someone like Reich with the body. You know, whereas the more Western scientist is in this very hard objective world, which is almost a little yeah. bit detached from the body. You know, something like that. Anyway, I don't know exactly, but. It's noticeable. I know what you mean. Yes, it's bewildering. Um, I still find it bewildering, the, the total absence of interest in mm -hmm. this country. Um, I can't find any explanation for it. Yeah, people, well, people just there. They just, I always used to think, I mean, they're not always real, but it, I lived in the west of England for quite a while in the southwest, you know, mm. and I was in a community and uh, they got you know, every summer there's like crop circles around there, you know, and the farmers charge you a fiver to go and look at the crop circle. And, and some are fakes, some aren't, mm. some aren't. Mm. And it's like, okay, it's so like some alien race or something is creating these mm. patterns in the, in the crops and no one's really interested or bothered about it. Or we go and look at it with the kids. So that's kind of nice, you know, but no one really sort of says, well, you know, aliens are maybe broadcasting messages to us here. That's quite a big thing, you know? It's like, they just go about that, you know, you go and see that and then they go down to shops, whatever, you know? It's like just part of the daily, part of your daily life to go and see the new crop circle 10 miles away. But, you know, you don't really inquire as to what it might be or mean or something like that. You know, it's kind of rather like, I think in, I remember reading the original native inhabitants of South and Central America when the Spanish and the Portuguese came you know, they just never seen a boat before, so they just ignored it. You know, it wasn't in their consciousness, you know. That's a very recognisable British syndrome, what you described about the crop circles. <laughs> and I, I, I've had the same reaction when I've had the organ accumulator on the show at a conference. Um, when I, Let's see, still lived down in Gloucestershire in about 1978-80. There were these alternative festivals at, in Cheltenham. And I had an, my organ accumulator there. And people would sit in it, you know, and say, oh, wow, interesting. Yeah, you know, it does this, it does that, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> Goodbye, and off they'd go, you yeah. know. <laughs> and do absolutely nothing further about it. You know, just like your crop circle people. You know, I mean, I don't I hold no brief for crop circle explanations at all. I've no idea. I haven't really gone into it, but um, I'm sure there's something worth investigating. <laughs> and I'm sure that lots of them are totally fake. <laughs> but yep. uh, maybe some of them are real. I just don't know. 
that, yeah. that, that's a very British reaction. Oh, yeah, it's fine. <laughs> well, well, you know what people, I mean? Yeah. yeah, yeah, totally. I mean, I just think it's just like if something doesn't fit into a category, you know, you just have little, you have a few little words that you can say inside yourself to dismiss it and get it out of the way because you've got a little, you've got your yeah. basic evolutionary task to get on with, you know, whether it's bringing up the kid, yeah. it's a drama, yeah. trying to make enough money, whatever, you know, you don't want to start worrying about all this stuff, you know, it's like, it's just how humans are, I think. And I think that finally the best thing we can do is like to keep presenting what we do and with a kind of open heart and, and, and be like that as rather than, I don't know, trying to convince people to somehow believe in something is not always easy or can be a lot of energy that, you know. Well, I think head on collision persuasion. Yeah, yeah I agree. It's a complete waste of energy and I never bother with it at all. Mm -hmm. um, you know, if, if the point of my website was to show that I'm present mm -hmm. And that if somebody's interested, they're welcome to get in touch, you know, and I have met quite a few people through the website mm. um, if they're interested. Mm. Um, but uh, colliding head on with someone who's a died in the wool mechanist and uh, thinks this is all rubbish, it's just a waste of time, in my opinion, anyway. Totally, totally, yeah. Yeah, you're you're you 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 you're, you're not going to win against someone who's already a hard skeptic. You know, there's, yeah. no, there's no point in a sense. You just want to, okay, it's okay. Mm. You know, it's like there's, there's not much there's not much point. I used to get, I'm telling people to get in the arch position, and there's occasionally someone who's so hard mental, it's like they want a whole scientific explanation. Yeah, you know, about why this, and, and I'm more like, well, you could just lean over and breathe and try it, you know, that's mm. also, you know, not yeah. in a nasty way, you know, just say yeah. that feels so valid to experiment like that, and then they do that, oh, yeah, I feel better now. Yeah. <laughs> Otherwise, yeah. they expect to read a book on it before they're kind of going to actually invest the time to just lean over for two yeah. minutes or something, you know. It's not that loads of people are like that, but there are people who are like that, you know, where's the evidence? Where's the scientific hard evidence for this? And you're like, mm. Well, we don't really research these things, you know, and you can just test it yourself and see if it works. And I think most people are kind of okay with that, really. You know, it's not like something that is, because bio is pretty, you know, it's not something that you could easily kind of, you know, claim to have some massively bad thing because a lot of the postures are just things that look like something in yoga or whatever. There's a different yeah. process. You know, it would be hard to make a convincing case that this was dangerous in some way. You know, you'd have to really, you'd have to struggle quite hard. Especially just it. doing it once or twice, you know, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Hey, it's nice to have a chat with you, Peter. Thank you. Likewise, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Do you have anything I... else? Sorry? Do you have anything else you'd like to mention or put out or whatever? I mean, um, we can always do another one sometime, but if there's anything... Well, there's there. probably all sorts of things, you know, that we could talk about further. Um, but nothing that sort of comes to mind offhand. Um, if I can think of. What's the name of your website? I know it's down at the moment, but it's coming back soon, hopefully. Well, my organisation, I call CORE, C-O-R-E, which stands for Centre for Organomic Research and Education. Mm. Um, and I like CORE, you know, because that goes straight, it's one of Rice's concepts, isn't it? Your, your CORE, your basic yeah. centre. Um, so I've kept it as that, although I'm not too happy with centre, you know, because centre is a bit of an abstract word and I don't I pr always prefer definite things to abstractions but I'm I've kept it as core for the time being and the the actual link is organomyuk.org.uk and I'll keep that's the domain name you know and I'll keep that I hope yeah yeah it's a huge rambling site it's got nearly 300,000 words on it. Wow. And it's basically text with, with some photographs here and there, uh, partly because I don't know how to do anything different. 
you know, I can handle Word and I can transfer Word text onto the site. Um, and I made it my business to try and hand out information. So lots of people, it seems, wouldn't buy a great big book, you know, but they might read the equivalent of 10 pages on a website, say, about character armoring. There's pages on organ therapy, on the bion experiments, on childbirth. Mm -hmm. There's a particular page on VBAT, if you know what that means, vaginal birth after cesarean, because mm -hmm. I had a few inquiries from women about that. So I thought, well, this merits its own page. Mm -hmm. There's a page on breastfeeding and baby therapy. Um, there's a page more about core, about the equipment we've got and what we do. There's a very little page about the finances, you know, because again, that's a, a skeptic's thing you know where's your money come from who's paying you yeah um you know that suspicious attitude so i explained that and so a page about helping core uh all the various fairly obvious headings um if you think about it mm. um oh and one on neuroscience and the memory business as i talked about um there was even a page in russian because I found from the analytics that I had quite a lot of visitors, site visitors from Russia. Mm -hmm. And I had a page, what is ergonomy? So I translated that myself and posted it. But mm -hmm. that got lost when I transferred from one.com to PicaWeb. Mm -hmm. I don't know whether their software couldn't cope with the Cyrillic alphabet or something. Anyway, it disappeared. Yeah, yeah. Um, Technical blah, blahs. Yeah. Anyway, that's cool. Hopefully your site is, is, is coming online again soon and then people can, can check it out. Well, it, even if the old site's lost, once I've got a site that I can add to, I'll just start writing it out again, you know. Yeah. And I have got the, uh, the backup. It's about five years old, so the more recent material will not be there. Mm. But I can still use that if I wish. Mm. Mm. But I've also got my booklets, you know, 50, mm. 52 titles now. Yeah, yeah. They're the, the background text to lots of things as well so i'm not going to have to rewrite the whole thing by any means well it's lovely to it's lovely to meet you peter you know a man Thank who's you. really you know you devoted you devoted a big chunk of your life to the work you love and you know not received a great amount of reward but you've you as i can see it but like it's beautiful that you've done that you know i think that's a really meaningful life so I'm very happy. Well, thank you very much. That's, uh, that's uh, made my day, as they say. Uh, it's been great to talk to you. You know, I'm sure, you know, let's have another go. Yeah. Um, yeah. When we've yeah, we'll uh, re-watched this interview and chewed over it, I'm sure we'll think of further things. And there's plenty I would like to ask you about. Mm. Yeah, let's do it. Let's do it. Mm. Okay. Let's...